Peter Gurney. On April 1st, 2017, a new roommate moved in with me. At the time, I was living in a three-bedroom apartment. Still hadn't filled the third room. Um, I was in the middle of two years of a pretty serious depression that thankfully has since subsided. Um, I was also in the middle of a graduate program for an occupation that I didn't particularly want. Um, and I had been living by myself for the entire month of March after I had somewhat unceremoniously asked my previous roommate to move out, uh, which had been a very emotionally difficult situation because we had been very good friends up until that point. Um, so when my new roommate moved in, I was really hopeful that it would spark a change in my life, uh, or at least that it would give me some company um, and would be a really positive influence. I met Julia through Craigslist. Um, I did a very thorough search through Craigslist, having had quite a bit of luck in the past in my life with uh, interactions in Craigslist, uh, whether for housing situations or buying an assortment of plants. And she advertised herself as a 31-year-old female farmer who liked to spin and knit, which sounded like someone who'd be very pleasant and easy to live with. When she moved in, I still remember the evening. I was listening to Zaido Co music and uh, cooking some casserole. Uh, and she knocked on the door, and she was wearing a sweater that she had knit. And she was just very charming and just easy to interact with. And we hit it off very easily. Um, I was really attentive to making sure that I was uh, the perfect uh, host, at least in this new home of hers, and made her feel as welcome as possible because it had really been a really tough situation in the prior uh, rooming dynamic that I had, so I really wanted her to feel welcome. And we did hit it off really well. Um, we were able to converse really easily. Uh, it just felt like a really natural, easy relationship. By the second night that she was there, we started playing cribbage, and this became a nightly habit of ours. Every night, around 8.30, before we go to bed, we'd play a game of cribbage. Um, my last roommate, who I kicked out, left a pot or a tin of hot chocolate mix, so we'd make hot chocolate and play cribbage. And uh, we started making a tally on the refrigerator door of uh, how many games each of us had won. Um, she consistently would win more than me, even though I think my cribbage skills are much better than hers. Um, but it was a really nice, relaxing way to end each evening, and it gave me a little bit of comfort at this time when I kind of all day was at this at UVM taking classes that I just wasn't interested in with people who I didn't particularly like. So we continued you know, playing cribbage every night, and everything was going well. And the first weekend that she was there, um, this was at the beginning of April, and we had one of these 70 degree days. It was crazy. It was just nice and sunny. You could smell the earth. Uh, and after the winter, I had just taken the studded tires off my bike. And it was just like the world had come alive. You know, one of those first really nice warm weekends. Um, so Julia was like, hey, would you mind showing me around, you know, town? So we biked the four miles or so into Burlington. And it was just nice and sunny. We went to the knitting shop because she really likes to knit. And then we thought about maybe, you know, getting some food. And I was like, oh, I don't know. There aren't, I, I, there aren't any places I really like. And uh, she suggested that we get some hot dogs and go home and eat them on the lawn. And I, in all seriousness, probably my, most, my greatest vice in life might be processed meats. Um, I, I like to think of myself as somewhat of an ethical omnivore, uh, whatever bullshit that means. But I really like hot dogs, like fried bologna sandwiches, that kind of thing. So when she suggested eating hot dogs, I was like, oh, I'm in. And so we got like a blanket and put it out in the lawn, and we ate hot dogs and just chatted, and it was fantastic. I, I was just on cloud nine. The following day, she suggested that we spend the evening by watching my favorite musical, Showboat, which I had recently purchased. A uh, new DVD of the San Francisco Opera uh, had done a production of it. It's supposed to have really good production value. Um, the musical actually wasn't so good. There were a few vocalists who I didn't think did that great a job. Um, but 
watching Showboat with Julia was rather exciting. And it was around this time that I started thinking, like, you know, there might be, there might be something here. But I didn't really want that. And it was very confusing, because this is a woman who had moved across the coast after getting out of a six-year relationship and, um, and had met me on Craigslist as someone who didn't know her at all previously. And I was like, eh, and I was sort of involved with someone else at the time. I was like, this, you know, if, if this is going to happen, I'll let you know, her make a move. I'm not going to do anything. So I did nothing. The following weekend, we went to an event called uh, Jazzy Yoki. It's this thing where you sing these songs, and it's fun. Um, and uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't tell her that I like liked to sing or anything. And she was just like mesmerized by, you know, this, oh man, this guy just likes to sing. And she was very impressed. And so on the way home, we say I, uh, she insisted that I continue to sing these songs. And I was belting out all my favorite songs from Showboat. And it was really exciting. And I remember getting home, and there was just like this tangible fire that you could feel. And I was really excited just to be with her. And I remember we got back, and we both uh, went to the bathroom. And I remember her coming downstairs. And I remember noticing that she didn't have her tights on underneath her dress anymore. And the two of us kind of stood there and talked kind of awkwardly, and both drank about like three glasses of water. And then we went to bed. This dynamic kind of continued on for a while. Eventually, we both started kind of dating some other people. She saw this guy named Joe, whose last name, I won't tell you, but it started with O, and it rhymed with something dirty, if you pronounce, pronounce it incorrectly. This kind of like, this dynamic went on for a while, and eventually I sort of lost interest. And after living with her for about a year, it got to the point where I almost even resented that she was around. Uh, she went through a period of unemployment, and it was rather difficult to have had that kind of interaction and to, for it never really to have come to fruition and not to have been able to communicate honestly with her about it. This past summer in August, she told me that she was going to be moving out. At this point, I didn't really feel too strongly about it. Um, I'm kind of in and out of the apartment at this point, and so I figured, you know, that's okay. Um, but when she moved out, it sort of felt like something was missing in my life. There's still the tally on the door of the refrigerator that shows how many cribbage games each of us has won. She's eight games ahead. At this point, I'm not sure that I'd really want to be in a relationship with her or pursue anything with her. And I'm not sure that if I was in that same situation again, that I would have taken any action. But I know that with Julia, I darn well should have. Steve Adams. December 6, 1952. Exactly 66 years ago today, one of the headlines in the Barry Daily Times read, Playmate rescues Websterville Tot from Cory Hole. I was that Webster taught. I was th three years old. The playmate, who was actually the hero of this story, was my five-year-old neighbor named Tinker. Because I think a lot of stories that have heroes have villains. I'm going to cast my mother as the villain in this story <laughs> for her lack of supervision. This is actually just one of several examples of my early childhood that I could cast her in that role. But in her defense, she had three kids by the time she was 19 years old. And shortly after this incident, we moved away from Websterville at her insistence. Um, so we were living in an apartment above Lawson's store in Websterville at this time. When I say we, I mean my mother and father my four-year-old brother, Butchie, uh, three-year-old me, and my one-year-old sister, Bonnie. Lawson's store at that time was sort of the epicenter of the granite quarry industry or, or community. And our family had a history with the quarries. My dad's dad worked in the quarry. My uh, dad's uh, brother worked in the quarry. My step-grandfather worked in the quarry. And my dad was a Derrickman at the Wetmore and Morris Quarry, 
which was located just up the hill from Lawson's store. And I remember there was a path through the woods that my dad would walk to and from work every day. Right behind Lawson's store, about maybe a quarter of a mile at the most, there was an old abandoned quarry hole called the Canton Quarry. Um, there was a lot of reasons why a quarry hole would be abandoned. The main reason would be that the vein of granite that they were mining would be depleted. Um, or simply the amount of water flowing into the hole they couldn't keep up with and the hole would fill up and they'd have to stop working it. I'm not sure what reason the Canton Quarry was stopped work. They stopped working it, but it, it hadn't been worked for years. And it was filled to water right to the top, probably anywhere from 60 to 100 feet deep, depending on where you measured. So the thing with memories, I mean, when I was thought of telling this story, it's like, well, I remember this, certain parts of this incident, but I was three years old. And that's like, how do you know how accurate that is? Um, my mother recently gave me a, a clipping from a newspaper article that was written at that time. And I read that clipping and I was amazed at my memory was pretty accurate on what happened, but I was also amazed at things that happened that I had no memory of, too. So I'll share my memory first of the incident. So we, meaning um, my brother Butch and Tinker, were playing near the Canton Quarry, and I remember the ice looking like glass. It looked so smooth, and all I could think of was I wanted to see if I could see any fish through the ice. So the granite slab leading down to the water's edge, um, I remember it was, seemed like it was sloping toward the water and it was snow covered. So probably slippery. And I remember being on my belly to, so that I could look over the edge and, and down through the ice. And I remember I couldn't see anything through the ice and I was, because the, the reflection of the sun was glaring off the ice. So I put my hands up to shield my eyes from the sun being three years old, I thought that was probably pretty smart. And it actually worked. I remember seeing right through that ice way down into the water. I also remember being really disappointed, maybe even angry, that I did not see a single fish. My next memory is I am freezing cold, soaking wet, walking home with my brother on one side and Tinker on the other. And I remember it being really hard to walk because my clothes were freezing. And I, I'll never forget the feel and the sound of the ice breaking off my arms and legs as I was moving. And that's really the extent of my memory of that incident. So when I read the newspaper article, uh, which it, it seemed like the writer had interviewed us uh, taught or kids for that story because he quoted us, and he also interviewed my dad, I guess. but. According to that article, uh, the boys were playing at the uh, quarry hole, and little Stephen, which was me, went through the ice and fell into the water. And it also described how I was hanging onto the edge of the ledge with my fingertips uh, immersed into the ice cold water up to my neck. And the article went on to say that my brother, my four year old brother, Butchie, did what most four year olds four-year-olds would do, he stood there crying. So thinking of doing this story, I checked with my brother to see if he was okay with me sharing that. He said he was, but unless I had video proof, he denies there was any crying. So the story, goes, uh, the writer goes on to say that Tinker uh, told the writer that he knew he didn't have time to go get help. Imagine that, a five-year-old being able to think like that in that situation. So anyway, he went onto that sloping, slippery slab of granite and grabbed my head to pull me out of the water. That didn't work, so he grabbed my wrist and hauled me right out of that water. And so uh, Tinker and my brother Butch helped me walk home. And according to the article, when we got home, my mother called the, uh, News, uh, the doctor, and he said, put me in a warm bath, try to slow me warm up, uh, slowly warm me up. And I guess that worked, and I was just left with the memory of this incident. So there's no logical, oh, and my dad actually was called home from work, and he 
retraced our steps through the snow right to the water's edge and the hole in the ice. So to verify that that's actually what happened. Um, but there's no logical, reasonable explanation why the headline in that paper 66 years ago today didn't read, two young boys go through the ice in the old Canton quarry and drown. But instead, it read, Playmate rescues Web Websterville taught from quarry hole. And because of that, I'm here to share this and say thanks for living, L listening. Dash. E pluribus unum. I've been thinking a lot about that lately. It has kind of a highfalutin way of describing the greatness of our country and how we've, we've gotten here because of all the diversity that we have. And I was also thinking about how, the, you know, our predecessors used words that, like, e pluribus unum. I mean, if it was left to me, it would have been, yeah, it kind of takes all kinds. <laughs> and, you know, luckily that's not on your money. Um, I'm not here to talk about politics or, well, sort of I am, but um, I'm really here to talk about a, a lesson that I learned over four decades ago when I got out of school um, and I was a young adult, I was a punk ass kid and um, learned about reaching from my boss, the least likely of all, all sources for this. Uh, in my first job after school, he, uh, taught me about reaching beyond our differences and reaching a common goal and focusing on that. Um, when I got out of school, I, I basically went to engineering school. I, I got a job in a small engineering section of a small town outside of Newark, New Jersey, and um, worked with four guys, three guys, me, I was the fourth. Town engineer was my boss. I was the assistant engineer, and there was a guy, my a contemporary of mine, who was a surveyor, and there was another guy who was like my boss, was about 50 years old, and he was a construction inspector. Each noontime, we would actually just stop work, go to a table that was in the middle of the office. Howard, my boss, would come out of the out of his out of the office and sit down with us, and he would start to opine about current events, and. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't get it at first, being a new guy, but then I realized that this is basically almost a daily event where he would just start talking about politics and religion. And, you know, I, within about a week, I found out he's basically a right-wing right religious zealot. He was a fundamentalist Christian. It was the first time I ever dealt with anybody like that. All of us were basically white, middle-class, entitled uh, guys. Um, but then that's where the similarities kind of ended. We, uh, we also did all live within, we grew up around Newark, New Jersey. And uh, so the rancor in this, in this noontime conversation, once I started getting the feel of it, and uh, you know, I just started to join in on it, and it was just, just kind of getting ridiculous. Because I would argue, I was just like diametrically opposed to him from in, on a religious and political perspective. And uh, after a particularly rancorous time, about a year in, I decided it's time to actually change this track. And I came in thinking, I'm just going to talk about um, when I went to school, uh, I took this one humanities cl class. It was the only humanities class I had to take to graduate. And I was telling these guys about how I didn't, you know, I had no intention of taking it, or I had no interest in taking it, except I had to use it, I had to get it, you know, in order to graduate. So uh, this, the guy that taught it, his name was uh, Doc Estrin. I still remember that. I think I'll remember it till the day I die. But he, uh, he was just a remarkable guy. And the first, I said this, the class was totally different than any of the engineering classes I took. Because for two weeks he just talked to us and he just to draw everybody out from the, you know, the class. He would, he would start talking about personal things. He'd talk about family. He'd talk about everything, and uh, um, it was just remarkable. And then after the two weeks, he basically uh, started this. What was like? He was like the circus barker. He was going up and down the, the aisles and tapping people on the on the shoulder and saying, you know, George, stand up for a second, talk to the class. And after about you know 30 seconds, he says, so George here. He's from, uh, he, he grew up, you know, within a stone's throw of Newark, 
um, like most of you did, um, but I can tell he was from the suburbs uh, west of here. Uh, just there's the dialectic tells that, that tell me about that. And he started to explain how uh, the fact that even New Jersey, there's, there's these regional dialects that you know, are easily discernible to somebody who has an ear for it. And you know, to me, that was remarkable because I thought you either were like north or south of the Mason-Dixon line, which kind of defined what your dialect was. Um, and so you know, he identified, he's going up and down the aisles and he's talking to people. He's from Philadelphia, he's from Pittsburgh. So the denouement of this whole sin thing was he, uh, he, he ca calls on my friend Mike. And uh, I had known Mike since the beginning of school, so this is like three years in. And uh, he says, uh, Mike here is from California. And I said, what? I, I, Mike's from California? I thought he was another New Jersey boy. <laughs> so he uh, <clears throat> explained that Mike had this dialectic tell. He was basically, people from California have um, what is called to linguists the perfect American English dialect. And, uh, and it just resulted from the migration uh, in the 19th and 20th century from the, you know, the gold rush on. And uh, so the, it just resulted in, in this distillation, the melting pot of dialects so that it didn't have any real, uh, you know, it's, it's actually hard to tell what they're from California. But Doc Estrin knew that. And I just kind of sat back thinking, you know, this is a good, good lunchtime. And as I sit back in my chair, the table almost came at me because Dom on the other side of the table is just like, what the fuck are you talking about? How, how the hell could you tell, say that California is a perfect American dialect? They're just a bunch of hippies and commie freaks and dope smokers. And I, whoa. <laughs> it's like, easy, easy there, Dom. And Howard and Elmer, who are, are trying to basically just calm them down. There's nothing to be excited about here. All this is about is how people talk in different parts of the country. Don't get excited about it, Dom. As he's saying this, I'm realizing Dom's you know, not letting it go, and he just kind of, kind of said, uh, I realize that he wasn't really too concerned about California being the center of, or the perfect American dialect. He was concerned that Linden, New Jersey, was not and uh, or the Jersey Shore, whatever. Um, and he starts calming down, but Howard just calls. He just says, okay, guys, let's go back to work. George, come into my office. And in a year, I had never gone to his office, and I'm thinking, oh, shit, I mean, like, <laughs> what's going on? So he closes the door. He goes, what's going on with Dom? You know, you think he's okay? And I said, I was about to answer, but then I realized it was rhetorical. He says, hey, why don't you sit down? I want to do your performance evaluation. I said, oh, shit, <laughs> wait a minute. Um, to a performance evaluation, I didn't know that there was such a thing to do, you know, and I, I'm saying this to myself. We just barely had this knockdown drag, knock drag out fight. So uh, he quickly put me at ease. He said, uh, you, you know, he just gave me this glowing evaluation. He said, you're, done, you're doing a good job. And I look at the elephant in the room and I say, well, but Howard, uh, we don't, I mean, you pretty much told me to go to hell yesterday in, this, in the uh, argument we had during lunch. He says, yeah, but... That's lunch. I mean, that's not you know that's not their work. You do good work, and uh, that's all you're here to talk about. And uh, you know, and when all said and done, you can go to hell. And uh, <laughs> and he smiled, and that was it. So, thank you. Dennis McSorley. This is how and when I found out there was no Santa Claus. Um, I was 11 years old. I'm the oldest of the three kids at the time. I have two sisters, and it was my job to be the brother and to not, uh, you know, mess anything up. I wrote the letter to Santa Claus because I had the good penmanship from parochial school. I put the list. I said we were good. There was no doubt about it. It didn't need a stamp. It got sent off. And uh, my sisters were uh, seven and four and our dog was like five. Now Christmas at our house was a spectacular event. My mother is Hollywood, crazy, live trees, ornaments the size of my ear, I mean light bulbs the size of my ear. I don't know how we didn't burn our houses down back in those days. And my sisters are wearing robes with poodle silhouettes on them. I've got a robe and slippers on, look like I'm 45 years old, I'm 11. and and. Um, and my mother is uh, all excited, and she's got the Kodak 8 millimeter movie camera along with the 
four lights that get attached to it that are just like this spotlight in here to blind you. It's like runway lights. And she's filming every Christmas we've ever had, including this one. And um, so the letter's been sent, the thing is it was sitting around, it's Christmas Eve. Um, and I've already gotten to the point where I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking it through. Reindeer don't fly. We don't have a chimney. Um, wh wh what are we talking about here? How is this man actually getting around to do all of this? You know, I mean, I'm starting to question things as a, as a fifth grader, you know, logically. The doorbell rings. And my mother goes, oh, who could that be? And, you know, who, who could it be? So... She says, Edward, my father, Edward, Dennis, go see who it is. So we, we go through the kitchen to the front of the house, which is a dark hallway. My grandma didn't believe in putting lights on. She's from the depression. We go outside on the porch, and there he is. Joe Cress. It's not Santa Claus. It's Joe Cress, who's a cop friend of my father, dressed very badly as Santa Claus. He's got his work shoes on. He's got these cover things that go over it. He's got a, actually has a pillow stuck inside this like five and dime store thing. He's got a cotton beard. He has a five o'clock shadow. You can see all the time. He's one of those guys that if he shaves, it doesn't matter. And he's got the hat and he's got this sack of stuff over his shoulders. And my father, go, my father just goes, <laughs> And he says, you okay? And Joe goes, yeah, I'm okay. He goes, just a second. So they have a cigarette. My father and Santa have a cigarette. <laughs> they light up a Chesterfield and a Paul Mall. And Santa takes a little pint out of his back pocket. <laughs> and they take a little pull on the whiskey. And my father has a little pull on it, too. And they're ready to go now to meet the rest of the, to the kids. So we go down, we're heading down the hallway. And my father just kind of turns and just looks at me and gives a little nod. So it's a father-son story. He didn't have to say a word. He gave me that nod like, you know. And in we go, and my, my sisters are like over the moon. They are like, they're, in, they're into this full heart. He, oh, ho, ho, and the, the camera's going. Santa's sitting down, the dog is jumping around. He's got ribbons on the hair and everything. And all stuff is coming out of this bag that none of us, not, nothing was on the list. It was all stuff my mother went out and got anyway. And football helmets, I hate football. A chemistry set, what are you, kidding me? And, and, um, and, and that, that was, so the proof was there. Now, I have a son uh, of my own, the only child, and he's, uh, well, he's in his 40s now. Uh, and uh, we used to put the cookies and, and the glass of milk when he was growing up. And then in the morning, you know, the, half the cup is gone, the cookie's gone. Wow, Santa came, you know. And it was wordless, wordless. It just happened that I never had to say anything to him. It just sort of dissolved, right? Maybe that's how it's supposed to go. And my son now has two sons. One's 14, the other one's eight. And little Alex still is a true believer. And I'm sure that Jack, the 14-year-old, is feeling like I felt. And I talked to my son about this and said, you know, what are you going to do? He says, probably nothing, Dad. We're just going to let it happen like you did with me <laughs> and like my father did with me. So it's sort of a family father-son tradition, I think, and we don't spoil Christmas about it all because it's really about the spirit of love, giving, and being with your family. Happy holidays. Thank you.